What a great way to tick off today's global event, the latest in our Changemakers series. Hello everyone, I'm Gillian Moore, and I'm delighted to be your host here today uh, on our Changemakers event with Malala Yousafzai. From our studio here in London, a warm welcome to you from wherever you're joining us today. As leaders, we all know there is no rule book for the world in which we now live. To embrace continual change, we need to tap into diverse insights and break with conventional thinking to do what matters. That is the purpose of Avanar's Changemakers community, to inspire you with diverse leadership perspectives. There are many reasons why Malala is a fascinating guest and the perfect example of a change maker. I'm personally really looking forward today to hearing about her passion for technology and how it helps support education for girls. But let us know in the chat what you're most looking forward to about today. At Avanade Advisory, we're intentional about bringing together the dual perspectives of experienced leaders and young leaders to help clients define what matters. So, for me, today's conversation with Malala is an exciting opportunity to get her unique perspective on how to engage young people and early career leaders to supercharge innovation. But I know there's going to be so much more we can learn from Malala, and I'm really looking forward to her conversation with our Chief Marketing Officer, Ruth Rowan. So let's make this an interactive event. We'd love to hear your thoughts as the event progresses, so please keep the comments and questions coming. And as a final piece of housekeeping, you can review bios for Malala and Ruth and other relevant event content below this screen. So let's get into it. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome to the Changemaker stage, Avanade's Chief Marketing Officer, Ruth Rowan, and Malala Fund founder, Malala Yousafzai. Thank you, Gillian, for that introduction. I'm personally really excited about today's conversation. I'm a global leader of an organization of 60,000 people. I'm also a female leader. Um, I am the uh, proud auntie of three teenage nieces, um, but really excited to also have the opportunity today to interview a fellow student of Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, um, Malala. So I'm sure today's conversation is going to be inspiring, is going to be informative, and also help all of us really focus on what matters. So welcome, Malala. We're honoured to have you with us. Thank you so much, Ruth. And uh, I'm really excited to be here with a fellow alumni from the same college. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, um, so many things in common, albeit I think 25 years difference in terms of our, our graduation date. So congratulations on your recent graduation. So the title of our event series is Changemakers. And I know that you were back in 2014 uh, recognized by the Asia Society as their change maker for the work that you've led. Um, really inspiring for us. But let's maybe just start with what inspires you. You know, I think I'll first start with change makers. You know, change makers are people who believe in a vision and a mission and they make it happen. A lot of us have ideas in our mind but the change makers are the ones who go into action and ensure that their dreams in their head come true. I have many change makers in my mind who I look up to. Most importantly, it is my father. Uh, he was a vocal advocate for women's rights, for girls' education, for peace and stability in Swat Valley. And for me, it was his activism that inspired me because I saw a person in action, doing the work, pushing for the change he wanted to see. He was not just talking about it, but he was he was doing the work. And I always tell people that, you know, back then we did not even know the word like feminism and all of this, all of these jargons. But my dad was a feminist in action. He was already working on that mission. And one of the greatest things that he did was that he did not stop me from speaking out. People ask me that if there was anything unique in my story, in my experience. And I always remind people that it could have been any girl instead of me. It could have been 
any girl from South Valley who could have spoken out. In fact, there were girls who wanted to speak out, but their fathers or their brothers or the men in society stopped them. So he was a change maker. He continues to be a change maker who inspires me. But I also look up to women leaders, especially Benazir Bhutto, who was the first female prime minister of Pakistan and also the first female prime minister in all the Muslim countries. So she set an example for women around the world, even like, you know, in, in countries in the develop in the developed world where we are still waiting for female prime ministers and president. So she set this example for women, for uh, girls, for the future generations that yes, women can be leaders. Yes, they can actually break these stereotypes, these glass ceilings, these iron bars. Thanks for that. It sounds like you've been inspired by so many different sources, Malala, through 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 the work that you do. And great to hear another reference to another LMH alumni in Benazir Bhutu. Um, so you have the opportunity to engage with so many different people from the world of politics, corporates and wider influences. And you also have a role as a leader yourself in chairing the multinational Malala Fund. How do you inspire um, and encourage others to, to embrace change in the world? Advocacy for change is, is part of my job. And, you know, I am talking to world leaders, to corporate leaders, and I stick to my mission and my message, which is that we need to prioritize investing in girls' education. I know that when I meet a lot of them, they uh, they are positive about my story and and the mission. But when it comes to taking action, when it comes to doing something pragmatic and practical, then we see little, and that sometimes uh, is frustrating. Uh, but I believe that there is something uh, unique about this 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 world of activism, and in this you have to remain a bit stubborn because stubbornness allows you to ensure that everyone else takes your mission seriously especially when you are you know just 16 year old yourself you are a school student uh, your message can be ignored people can appreciate your story but they might be missing out on the key message which is that they should invest financially in the quality of education in access to education they need to be providing all the facilities that are needed for children to have the right uh, content and the right curriculum and the right facilities. And they also need to factor in gender in their education policies. So the work continues. Uh, and I and I often think that people will get tired of me, but you know, I'm not going to give up. I'll continue to promote girls' education. And there have been so many uh, positive moments, uh, you know, at the G7 and G20 summit, some leaders have been very supportive towards girls' education. They have even made financial commitment, but you know, you never know. There are external shocks. There are uh, things that are happening internally that slows down the pace of progress. And my concern is that how long will it take till we see the last girl entering her school? So the work continues, but um, you know, I think I think it's just reminding everyone the sense of urgency related to girls' education, and also reminding them that this is an issue that should not be treated in in, in isolation, because this issue is connected to so many other problems that we want to address, from reducing poverty to tackling climate change to also uh, ensuring that we create a gender uh, equitable and inclusive world. I love what you said there about stubbornness, you know, even at 16, being stubborn about your cause, but then really focused on the practical actions that people can, can take to change the world a little step at the time. Um, can you share a little bit more about your mission to enable girls and women to learn and also to step, take that step to become leaders? My mission is to see a world where all girls have access to safe, quality and free education. Everyone is probably well aware of my story by now that uh, I was one of the girls. I was one of those girls who could not go to school when I was 11 years old. And that was when a group of extremists announced a ban on girls' education. Something very similar to what we are hearing again happening in Afghanistan, where the Taliban, the de facto government, have actually just um, uh, forbidden girls from entering their secondary school. So they are not allowing girls to be back in school. They are 
delaying the the return date so this is something that you know i can't believe that it's still happening you know in this 21st century years and years later um but this mission is to ensure that ev- that every girl has access to education that no girl is left behind and at malala fund we work with local activists in nine countries including pakistan nigeria afghanistan brazil um ethiopia india and these activists are working on changing policies they're working on improving the quality of education they're also working with local community leaders parents teachers to improve the, the quality of education and address the social norms and other cultural barriers that prevent many families from sending their daughters to schools we should not just be talking about girls and and their you know and and their rights as a um, sort of you know as as problems and like you know we are the ones who are going to go and fix it we need to engage girls in the process of making those critical decisions when we are making decisions about their lives about their future about their well-being we need to ensure that they are involved in those decision making process that they're that they're heard so you know i i believe that girls are not just there to tell their stories but they are there to make the change happen so at malala fund you know we have girls on uh in involved in all of those key decision making and uh, we also have like you know girls on our board as well vanessa nakate climate uh activist she sits on our board and she looks at the role of girls education in addressing climate change and she's just brilliant to have so to have young people on our board really helps us to make better decisions and we all know like if you are inclusive and we are diverse uh in those rooms of uh decisions we end up with better decisions yeah it's kind of crazy isn't it to think that actually the world for so long has been run without that voice at, in so many decisions given you know girls and women are half the population. So, um yeah, it's 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 inspiring in terms of the impact that you're having. Um you talked earlier about the role of your father and and really being that first change maker in your life. In the corporate world, we talk so much now about the importance of inclusivity and diversity, the topic you've just been talking about from a gender perspective. Um what do you think you've learned in the work that you've done around why the broader topic of diversity is so important to problem solving great decision making um you know moving the world forward in a positive way when i was uh, giving my un speech uh, at age 16 i i wanted to tell people why and how i realized that education was important and it hit me that i took my voice for granted i took my education for granted in the beginning and i only realized that it was something significant and important only when it was taken away and i said that we realize the importance of our voice when we are silenced and we see the importance of light when we see darkness so for me i realized the importance of education when it was taken away so in terms of this topic about inclusivity and diversity those of us who have never been in the rooms know why it is important for us to be in those rooms where decisions about our bodies about our about our future are made so and and you know there are several like studies and research is being done on this topic and it shows that when we have a diverse body of decision makers we end up with better decisions for our community for our organizations um because there when we make decisions we have to look at so many factors and if you don't have a diverse group there will be important factors that you will miss i come from a background where i know things from a student's perspective where i know it from a muslim or a pashtun or a pakistani's perspective but there are many things which you know which i'm not good at those are not my expertise but you know, there's somebody else who know it from uh their perspective and you know we need we need as many uh roles you know that we can take in in that room yeah goodness malala i can't imagine anything that you're not good at but we might get to that topic 
topic later on, um, but, but you're absolutely right. At Avenard, we're really passionate about the power of young voices. Um, we bring um, many of our young leaders in to help form our strategy in the business. We're really proactive in reaching into the student population. We've recently just actually completed our fuel conference this year, which was bringing 400 students um, together to, to experiment and, and innovate in science technology um, areas. Um, based on your experience, I love that you've been talking about practical things that, that we can do to, to move forward. What are some of the ways that all leaders listening to this conversation can today can tap into those ideas and those voices from young people, particularly to make change in, in their organisations? First of all, I would, in, you know, I would encourage everyone to engage girls in, uh, in the strategic conversations. Uh, and it's really important to hear the voices of young people, especially young women and girls. And, you know, we need to go beyond just following their stories and getting inspired from their stories. Now we need to ensure that we bring them in to be part of the, of, of the decisions, to ensure that we hear their perspective and their voices clearly. And also, this is what I like about young people. They are not constrained by the status quo. They have bigger vision and you know, they, they are fearless. They have big dreams about what do they want to see in their, in their future. So it's really important to have a balance between those ideas and then also those of us you know who have uh have been in this field and in this sector for many many years and so you know some of us have experience and we have the knowledge and we have done all the learning and then there are some of us who need to remind us that let's not be worried let's not be scared why not try this let's be a bit more uh a bit more fearless so you know there's even that dynamic that helps us to be a bit more creative and innovative in our decision making when we have young people involved, especially um, young women and girls. So there's that part. And then secondly, corporations and big organizations can also support, uh, NGOs can support all other groups who are uh, bringing a positive change in the community. They can uh, provide them donations and financial support, but also the expertise, the, the technical uh, and the, the technical education as well. A lot of NGOs they need help in, you know, in uh, in in making their work more efficient and effective. So, like you know, at Malala Fund, we are really glad that we have people who uh, are helping us in ensuring that we improve our organization internally as well. And so we appreciate all sorts of expertise that we can get. Uh, we love people in tech, so whenever they can help us in, with their brilliant minds, uh, we always welcome that. And I think, you know, if you can go and volunteer and support an NGO that, you know, that you feel passionate about, your support would really mean a lot to them if you can help them in their, you know, in their fundraising or just making sure that they can have a bigger outreach. All of these things will help. Yeah, great. I love that combination of that fearless energy of youth and that experience um, coming together to really kind of build that, that bold, brave momentum to make change happen. What a fascinating discussion so far. And thank you, everybody, for your comments. Please do keep them coming. As I'd hoped, Malala has already shared some valuable insights on how to engage young people and early career leaders. I'm particularly struck by the focus on uh, stubbornness and how important that is. And Malala's observation that young people are fearless also really struck a chord with me. I suspect that fearlessness is only going to become increasingly challenged by what we know is happening in the world at the moment and what is going to come over following weeks and months in terms of economic uncertainty and global challenges. So I think fearlessness is something that we all will need to embrace. We also would like everyone to learn from each other as a change makers community. So how do you, in your organization, engage young people? And more broadly, how are you bringing together diverse voices in strategy and innovation? As I mentioned in my earlier introduction, at Avenard Advisory, we're very passionate about bringing together these diverse perspectives to help clients define what matters. We'd love to help you explore some of these topics further. And also, we're here to help you connect with each other as well, so that you can learn from each other in this community. 
So please don't hesitate to reach out to us after today's event if you'd like to discuss any of this or help get in touch with anybody else on the call. And then as I hand back to Ruth, we'll run a short video with more details on the Avenard advisory approach. And then we'll continue with the second half of today's conversation with Malala. Um, let's shift gear a little bit. I think like like all organisations, like all of us um, that have weathered uh, the last couple of years of the pandemic, uh, that you and the work that you do with the Malala Fund have had to be creative um, with the way that you've operated and engaged um, your, your different audiences through the pandemic. Um, what did you learn through the last couple of years? I thought that, uh, and, and I think many of us think that progress is hopefully linear and it's going to keep, you know, increasing and, and we will see like improvements over time. But this pandemic reminded me that, that we should not take the progress we have made for granted and we should be prepared for any setbacks. The pandemic was one of those setbacks. Uh, as soon as the pandemic started, Malala Fund did uh, a research on it. It was based on the Ebola crisis and it showed that if we don't take the right decisions and action, up to 20 million more girls are at risk of losing their education, which was a big shock to me because I have been advocating and fighting for education and I only want the number 130 million to go down. I cannot expect it to increase. And when I heard about this figure that there's this risk in this time of a pandemic where we will see more and more girls losing out on their education. And we all know that when girls are um, are at home, when they are not regularly in schools, they're more likely to be helping in the household chores. They're also more likely to be married off uh, to reduce the burden on the family, or they'll be asked to help the families financially. So they will be taking a job. Uh, and many of these girls will be uh, facing the, you know, the, that social stigma or just all the gender uh, barriers that are there, they have to face that. And they're also less likely to have access to uh, technology because if there's one digital device, it's more likely that the boy will get access to that. We did so many studies in Pakistan and Nigeria and other places which showed that this was very true, that girls were like a very few number of them had access to the technology to continue their education in the time of the pandemic. So. That was my biggest concern. And in this time, we we started COVID grants to ensure that all the activists who we were supporting previously can now have the resources and the support in which they can ensure that all children learn. Our activists, they started doing their programs a bit differently. So they were using technology to ensure that girls still have access to education, even if they're not in their schools. Uh, they were using televisions uh, they were using mobile phone apps. And in some places, like the north of Nigeria, they were using radios. And girls loved it so much because when they would be at home, they would be uh, listening to their to lectures from their teachers. And it just ensured that they can, they should, that they do not forget what they have learned already. So it was a good like revision uh, course for them as well. And they liked it so much that they continued with it even after the pandemic. So for me, it was more important than ever to to push for uh, girls' education and you know all the opportunities that I have in my global and national advocacy. We continue to prioritize girls' education, so no one forgets about it. And also to remind everyone that as you talk about solving world problems and as you talk about addressing this health crisis, you must realize the role that quality education plays in preparing us to be. Uh, more resilient. So in order to build resilient economies and societies, we must invest in the education of girls and we must prioritize 
gender equity and inclusivity. Uh, yeah. But that was the work that I was doing <laughs> in the pandemic. Uh, I was also uh, in my final year of university and I was graduating at that time. So I spent the, the last few months of my university time at home, just like everyone else. I took my exams at home. I graduated at home and, and that was it. So um, I'm sure it was it was even harder for, for so many students. Yeah, gosh, I can't imagine going through that final period and the finals exams remotely from home. And there's so many traditions around finals, aren't there? I, I don't know if you were able to continue some of those, even though you were taking those exams at home. Yeah, you know, as you would know, uh, in Oxford, we have trashing. So as soon as you're done with your final exam, outside the exam schools, uh, your friends are waiting for you to throw uh, some like holy powder and like spray this shaving foam and like throw this confetti and just, it's just crazy. It's something like extremely crazy, uh, but it's, it's a way to celebrate that moment. And I was really sad that I was going to miss that. So I told my whole family, my parents, my brothers to ensure that I get that at home. And they they went and they and, and they did everything. So I got trashed at home. So you talked a lot there about um, technology, and I know you were talking there about different types of technology, and particularly radio in some parts of the world. Um, we at Avenard believe passionately in the role that technology plays in helping helping advance the world for everybody. What role do you see technology playing in helping girls get educated? Technology can play a crucial role in making education accessible to students uh, and, and children around the world. And it can also help us in reaching to children who would otherwise be ignored. Students who are based in remote areas or girls who come from communities where it would be really difficult for them to walk for three hours to get to a school uh, and, and many other factors. Even in this time of pandemic, we realized that technology could work. A lot of us were taking our classes on our laptops and we just adapted to the situation so quickly. So technology has already taken uh, a, you know, that space in, in, our, in our everyday life. And it's already part of like, the education systems in so many countries in the world. But I think in this pandemic, we also realized that not everyone has access to technology. And we need to ensure that no one is left behind when it comes to uh, accessibility. And especially it's important for women, uh, for girls and for people from uh, minority communities, from marginalized communities, from underserved communities. Because if technology actually does not help us address those problems, then you know, it's not actually serving the purpose here. So we wanted to serve the purpose of ensuring that education is accessible to all. And, you know, I hope that just as some of our activists have used uh, technology in the COVID time and continue to use it, um, you know, from in, in the form of radios or TV or mobile apps, that we take this forward and we try to it on a bigger scale as well. This would be great for us to uh, to see if we can, you know, take it from just a few hundreds and a few thousand schools to making sure that it reaches to like millions and millions of children. So I, I guess it will work. I think we need more creative and brilliant minds coming together to ensure that that we get it right. Uh, but I think you know, gender inclusivity; these are important factors that that we must consider. Yeah, I think that's so right. And I think there's, there's, you know, the pandemic has helped accelerate the use of technology in education, but there's still so much to do, isn't there? Um, you've talked so passionately, Malala, about the work that you do um, in ensuring that no girl gets left behind. And you've talked about the work that you do with, with governments, with politicians, with not-for-profits, with NGOs. Um, many of our um, people joining the conversation today are Avenard's clients who work in the financial services sector, in retail, in consumer goods, in manufacturing, in some of the world's biggest companies around the world. Do you have an ask of the people listening today, particularly from the corporate community, of what they can do to help? I think this is going to be my favourite question. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot that everyone can do here individually or as part of a corporate or an organisation. You could 
help us uh, get the financial support that we need to take our work to the next level to support projects like Talimabad and many others who, who, who need, who need financial uh, support, who also need your guidance, your expertise, you know, the technology that you have, if we can give it to them and if we can give the resources that you have to them, it will really help them in, in just taking their work to, to the next stage and making it available on, on a bigger scale. Uh, I have seen a lot of like creative and innovative activists. You know, one was in in Lebanon. Her name is Naila, and she runs this organization called Lebanese Alternative Learning. They have these uh, small devices called Tabshura, you know, which can be connected to up to thirty computers, and they ensure that all the content is put on that small device, and all girls have access to the curriculum and the content, and they keep learning and they have focused on um, students from Lebanon, but also the Syrian refugee children. And, 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 you know, and even in Afghanistan right now, one of the activists who we were supporting, uh, she now runs these secret schools and they also use technology uh, to ensure that girls keep learning. They have developed a whole system where they can track the progress that students are making uh, and ensure that they take classes regularly. So it's, it's, it's well monitored, it's assessed. And so, so there are these models that have been tried on a smaller scale. And I think, you know, just that help and support to now take it to the next level would mean a lot to them. Uh, and another thing which I really appreciate every corporate uh, do is that they include women and especially young women and girls uh, on their boards and in some of like their critical and, and key uh, decisions and, uh, and, you know, and, and just maybe having like a youth, uh, group that can guide them in what to do for a better, inclusive, safer, uh, healthier, cleaner future for our world. Brilliant. Thank you, Malala. So let's completely switch gears, um, and ha maybe have a bit of fun. So I think as we come to the end of the conversation, I'd love to ask you some quick five questions, if that's okay. Um, so let's see if we can do quick fire. So your favorite app or technology at the moment? I love notes. I love writing things down, making a list of things and, you know, just sticking the things I've done. So I love notes, my secret favorite app. <laughs> And music. I was um, listening to you on Desert Island and Discs, but is there a song that you never want to hear again? Um, <laughs> I don't want to offend anyone. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there there are there are songs. Uh, it's only because there is a song that is related to like your past that you don't want to think about that moment again. So, I think a lot of like Taylor Swift songs. I would say the trouble <laughs> that song. Um, I used to listen to it when I was in school. So I'm like, I, I don't want to think about those days again. And whenever I listen to the song, it reminds you of things. So, yeah, yeah. music music can be so emotive, can't it? I'm sure yeah. that's nothing against Taylor Swift. It's just of that connection. <laughs> I'm excited um, for her new album. So, <laughs> yeah. And what passion or hobby do you have that people would be surprised to know about? Many. I love sitting. I. I can't stand even for a second, wherever I find the opportunity, I find a chair and I sit down. Um, I also uh, loved Among Us, the game that everybody else was playing. So that is um, another thing. And then uh, I also, I play Wordle and I'm quite good at that. So ah, yeah. I think the whole world is obsessed with Wordle, aren't they? Uh -huh. I'm on numerous WhatsApp chat groups of Wordle performance over time. I don't think I've ever heard anybody have a hobby of sitting. So I love that one. I think I might embrace sitting as a hobby as well. Um, which technology have you been using that you don't think has been good or not worth the hype? I, 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 I appreciate all forms of technology. Um, I think I'm still getting used to the, um, to the world of like the VR, like the virtual reality. I think that would need a bit more practice. Um, you know, it's like for some of us, it's really, it's going to take a bit of time to adapt to the change. And yeah, so I'm excited for it though. I'm really excited. 
Yeah, it's going to bring so much opportunity, I think, for so many different so so many different industries and uses in in the coming decade. So, final quick, and this is probably not a quick question, but if we fast forward ten years, what change would you have liked to have seen happen in the world? In ten years, I want to be maybe sitting here again, having this conversation with you, hopefully in person, and telling you about the fact that yes, we were able to uh, work for a more um, inclusive uh, education. And we were able to ensure that all girls and all boys have, you know, had access to quality education. And like now we live in a world where no child is out of school. So that would be the conversation I would love for us to have in 10 years. Well, I hope I hope we are doing that, Malala, and hopefully it won't take 10 years. We can maybe be sat in a garden in Oxford and reflect on the fact that every child in the world has access to go to school. That would be a wonderful change, wouldn't it? Um, so on behalf of everyone here today, Malala, thank you for being a change maker in our world, for the work that you have led so passionately for the last 10 years. I think we all look forward to continuing to, to help amplify the work that you're doing. Um, we really appreciate you taking time to join us for this conversation. You've shared so many valuable insights that I'm sure we will continue to discuss, to be inspired by, to help all of us focus on what matters as a change makers community. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. It was so nice talking to you. And thank you so much to everyone who has listened to me patiently. I hope that you will follow the work of Malala Fund on malalafund.org and you will also follow us on like Instagram and Twitter and everywhere. And it would be amazing if you uh, follow our newsletter assembly and uh, you will hear stories of girls from girls directly where they will be talking about the problems that they face in this time and how they are addressing those problems from mental health to climate change to gender equality. And these stories will inspire you and it will also motivate you to take action. Uh, and I hope that you uh, find a role for yourself in how you can become part of the change that you want to see in the world. Um, a lot of us have dreams for a better world. It's making those dreams happen in reality. And it's really important for us to believe in that vision uh, when I was starting my advocacy and my activism for education, I had to believe in it before anyone else. So it's really important for you to believe in your mission and then go on and convince everyone else to join you to make that change a reality for all. What a great way to conclude. Thank you again, Malala. It's been an absolute privilege to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Big thank you there to both Ruth and Malala. I'm sure we've all been very inspired by today's discussion. And also I hope that everyone has learned a lot, not just about Malala and her passion for female education, but also what it takes to be a change maker such as Malala and some of the amazing traits that she has that makes her so successful and special in this field. A few of the insights Malala shared really resonated with me, such as Believe in your mission. Make sure that you have a clear message to inspire others. And be stubborn. If you don't have a diverse group contributing to decision making, there will be factors that you miss. And also, it's very important to enroll the voice of young people in the strategy. They're fearless and they will challenge the status quo, which drives creativity and innovation. Progress is most definitely not linear. We'd love to continue the conversation in the chat and after today. Um, also, I'd love to connect with any of you in the audience today directly over LinkedIn if you'd like to. And my global advisory team is ready to help you explore some of these topics further and connect with each other as well, um, both our, our experienced leaders and the member, members of our younger leaders community as well. So please look out for more Changemakers insights and opportunities to engage with our Changemakers community over the coming months. But for now, on behalf of Ruth and Malala, thank you for participating in today's event. Goodbye for now.